All right, we're back, and it's Comp 228, Java Programming. It's Week 8, Lesson 8, Part 1. We're doing a broadcast. I want to talk a couple of things today. Uh, one is uh, we kind of talked about last week, uh, kind of the, on, the, on the second part of the day, we talked about how uh, I kind of showed you the solution set for your exam, right? We talked about that, what, what you could have done differently. And today, um, like I promised, I'm, I've come up with a bonus assignment um, for you guys to do. And again, bonus assignment means it's on top of, um, it's an optional assignment. You don't have to do it. Uh, but if you do, it's a bonus. It means you, you'll, you'll get a, extra marks uh, for you to uh, add into your final grade. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So here's what it looks like. It's called array practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I, I talked about, uh, some people have already seen this kind of thing before. I've done it in C Sharp. Obviously, more people need it again. Um, it's in Java, so it's going to be slightly different in Java than it would be in, would have been in C Sharp. And again, it's just syntax, but a lot of times it's problem solving. So let's talk about this. Um, so again, using Java and Eclipse or an IDE of your choice, and people like using IntelliJ or um, something else, right, a NetBeans, um, you will write two small programs to demonstrate your understanding of arrays and or array list structures. Okay, so one is this dice rolling app that you'll make. Now, this is actually not 20 marks, it's actually a total of 24 marks, but anyways, don't worry. Um, so write an app to simulate the rolling of two dice and display how many times each result was rolled. So the app should roll, randomly roll uh, the first die and then the second die, right? That's two marks. And then the sum of the two die value should then be calculated. So let's say, for example, I can get a value between 2 and 12. This is an array, a matrix of what it looks like uh, for uh, how many times uh, a 2 can be rolled. Like you, if, you, if you notice, there's only one time a two can be rolled. You, you can roll a die with one, a one to six, and that's one out of one to six, and one. So there's only one chance that you'll get a two out of uh, out of all these chances, right? Same thing with 12. 12 is very low in terms of probability, right? And then, you know, three, there's two chances, uh, as an example. Four, there's uh, there's three chances, and so is, so is the same for 10. If you look, there's a mirror, and the most common number you can roll using two dice is seven, right? That's why they have that lucky game cramp craps, right, that you can play in, uh, at the casino and lose all your money, right? Um, anyways, not to say that I'm, I'm a casino game player. I don't do that, although I've used some of these examples in the past. But these are just probability things, right? So how would you, um, you know, what do you make when you make this first die and second die? Why am I asking you to do this? Because I want you to tally with some kind of structure, whether it's an array or whether it's an array list. This is the exercise here. I want you to tally how many times the sum of the two numbers are rolled to get a number. For example, uh, I want you to, and I want you to roll these numbers 36,000 times, all right, in, a, in some kind of loop, all right? So you have to think about the proper loop to do it in. And what you get here is a distribution. So, example, how many times, I want to know how many times was two rolled, right? How many times was three rolled? How many times was four rolled? And so on, up to 12. So out of 36,000 times, you're going to have you know, uh, seven being the most common one. So let's say seven takes up the majority of the rolls. Let's say 18,000 times seven was rolled, as an example. How do you figure that out? You have to use an array to tally, to keep track of. Or an array list structure is another way of doing that. Um, so you got to figure out how to do that. Arrays, in this particular case, might be the easier method because array lists might be more challenging to do, right? But that is the, the way I'd like you to try and do this, okay? So, um, and now, also, you want to, you know, uh, it says here, use a one-dimensional array or an array list to tally the number of times each possible sum appears, okay? Display the result in list format, not like this, in list format from 2 to 12, as an example, right? Um, and then uh, to the console or using a GUI window. So whatever you want to do, like a, uh, you know, a JFrame. It's up to you how you want to do the output. Um, I'll leave that to you in terms of how you, you present it. If you want to practice UI, make, a, make it put, out, put it out in a GUI window. Uh, if you don't care about that, you just want to get the marks, which I'm sure some of you do, the easier way to do it is in the console application. All right, here's the second piece, which is a lot more difficult. Uh, an airline reservation system, part two. All right, so a small airline has just purchased a computer for its new automated reservation system. You have been asked to develop the new system. You're to write an app, console or UI, to assign seats on each flight of the airline's only plane. You got one plane, right? Um, so think about uh, display the following alternatives in a console-based menu or appropriate UI component. One for first class, two for economy, and three for exit. So you have one, two, or three. What kind of what kind of seat do you want? 
you must use a switch statement in a while loop. Okay, so this is a menu, which means the menu will keep on uh, looping. It'll keep on asking you to make to uh, you know to assign a seat. So they'll ask you, hey, assign assign a seat. Which one do you want? First class or economy? Now you only have a limited amount of seats. You only have uh, first class seats are in sections one to five. So how would you think about you know putting this together in an array? And then your economy seats are in seats six to ten. So think about elements. You can store things in elements. Now this one would be much better suited towards an array list if you're doing an array list, but you can do it with an array as well. Um, and we'll talk about the ways to do that in a second. Okay, uh, I say use a one-dimensional array of type bool, so boolean array, uh, true <coughs> or false, or an alternate array list structure to represent the seating chart of the plane. So if I have uh, 10 seats in the plane, and if I have an array of a 0 to 9, 0 to, uh, as an example, to 4, might represent seats from a first class, and anything 5 and above is, is economy, as an example. How, do I, how can I tell if the seat is taken? Well, if the seat has false in it, that means it's not available. Or you can do it the other way around. You can say if this, everything is false, starting off as a default, and if the seat is taken, it'll be true, right? And that's why this is saying here. So we, we, need, we initialize our array, or the elements array, to false to indicate that all seats are empty. Or for an array list structure, allocate the appropriate number of elements for first class seats and economy seats which might be the better way to do it, because for an array list, there's no index, necessarily. You have, it's just a bunch of elements that are grouped in, inside a, a collection, right? So if I have uh, five economy seats, and I'm looking for economy seats, but there's only four left, and if I, if I have one, I just remove the economy seat availability. So you might create an availability uh, array list, and, you know, basically you choose, you, you pluck out those uh, those seats from the availability list until there's no more, right? And when there's no more, then you can offer economy. And if there's if they don't want economy, then they can wait. They have to wait for the next plane, right? Vice versa, if they if there's all the economy seats are taken, then they can <coughs> you can ask them to upgrade to uh, to first class. Most people don't do that in real life, by the way, because first class is like triple the money, right? But uh, let's just say they want to upgrade, they can do that. And um, when there's no more seats on the plane, you have to say, hey, you have to wait for the next flight. That's what this assignment's all about. Um, here's one that's what it says is, um, so as each seat is assigned, set the corresponding element of the array to true to indicate that the seat is no longer available. For an array list structure, remove the seat from the list, because that way you can access it if it's not there, right? So how do you assign the seat? And, you know, there's some, there's some questions around how to do this. You have to think about the proper way of doing it. This is an individual assignment. I would really ask you not to work with anybody else on this one. I want you to puzzle it out because you know what? I'm going to put more array stuff on your tests from now on. Every single test you're going to get, every assignment you're going to get, you're going to get a raise. And if you're not good at it, not because I want to punish you, because you need to know this as developers, right? I can't avoid the, the, you know, the arrays and array list stuff, right? So, and it's nothing to do, this last exam has nothing to do with your understanding of interfaces and polymorphism or anything like that. It was all, you guys didn't understand how to create an algorithm with an array or an array list. That's what it was all about. So please um, do this on your own, figure it out, puzzle it out, practice. This is a good practice and it's a bonus. This is, add, this is an optional assignment that it will add on to your, to your final mark. It's not going to take away. If you decide not to do this assignment, that's up to you. I'm not gonna, you're not going to lose any marks. But you won't gain any either, right? So, okay, so let's do the last piece. Um, your app should never assign a seat that has already been assigned. That's number one. That's how you're going to be judged. And when the economy section is full, your app should ask the person somehow if it's acceptable to be placed in the first class section and vice versa. If yes, make the appropriate seat assignment. If no, display the message, next flight leaves in three hours. So that's really it. That's your assignment number three, which is a bonus assignment. It's called a rape practice. Right, and we've done. I've done this exact assignment in C sharp, but obviously it wasn't enough, <laughs> so I got to do it again. Right? Um, any questions around this? This is due um, again next week, Friday by midnight, for you to get the bonus marks. Uh, I will not accept late assignments um, because, as an example, this is just pure bonus. Right? So, how about does anyone not want to do this one? I don't know. I, I don't see how you'd want not want to do this one. This is kind of a, a good one to do. You will be tempted, I'll tell you right now, to work on every assignment with your friends, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, not 23rd. Yeah. Yay! I don't know what that ha what happened there. I must have missed the thing. So I'll have to update the uh, the document a couple times now. Um, yeah, it's just saved November 13th, not November 23rd. 
actually on the, uh, here, let's just do that now. Now that you maybe do this, I'll just do it as we speak. I'll just print it to PDF. Um, anyways, uh, what the, assignment three, that's just silliness. Um, but it should say the same thing on your, in your uh, Dropbox there. It should say that, uh, here's just like, let's just close this off for a second. And I'll just take care of this now in, in, uh, in eCentennial just because you're setting it. Just so that way we're good. We're, we're good with all this kind of stuff. So um, the reason why I'm, uh, I think it's that. God, I'm losing my mind today. Oh, wow, I'm really losing my mind today. I know they've changed the passwords lately. That's why it's, uh, so i got to think about these things. Yay. Okay. Um, anyways, so um, uh, again, you might be tempted to work with somebody else on this because, you know, um, assignments in general, when you take in a programming assignment, they're tough. This one is like you have to puzzle it out a little bit. But if you always work with somebody else on assignments, you're going to be, you're going to really be bad at exams, right? And I can't take away the exam. Like you, this is, this is your chance to show that you know the stuff on your own, right? So please try and do this on your own, like as much as possible, you know, uh, try and make it work out. So that way, um, you know, you, you have a chance to learn from it. This is what this practice stuff is all about, right? And I know some people were like, yeah, Tom, all I care about is the marks. I get it. Right, uh, it's the classic conundrum. You know, you want to do well. I want to do. I want to have some really good marks, but um, you know, at the same time, um, you don't want to come away not knowing stuff. Right. So that's the challenge. The challenge is that you know you, you might come away uh, missing some piece of knowledge. As a developer, we we use these array and array list structures and collections in general to create compl com more complex algorithms. They're building blocks at the very uh, you know the very basics. Uh, so if you don't know how to do these things, then um, you'll, it's almost like you're handicapping yourself in some ways, right? So when I ask you to do stuff, and this, by the way, this applies to uh, things we do on the gaming side for, for our gaming students. Like if you're, if you're going to build a complex, uh, tomorrow I'm going to ask you guys, or maybe, the, maybe to later on today, we're going to build a, a procedurally generated level, right? With the, you know, with, uh, in 3D, right? So in order for us to do that, you're going to guess what you're going to use. You're going to use arrays, right? So... <laughs> If you don't know how to do that, and it's going to bite you somewhere, it's going to come at you, um, whether it's arrays or array lists or some kind of structure, um, you know, it's going to bug you. So please don't take this as, as something that um, um, you shouldn't do. It's definitely something that you need to do, and try and do it on your own. Okay. Any questions around assignment number three? Again, I will try and give out assignment number four tonight as well, which we'll be doing in a couple weeks, and it'll probably be a UI assignment just on, on UI, because we've been Talking about UI for a couple weeks, this will be the next uh, one we're going to be doing. And I'm going to be, for the rest of the, the, the day today, I'm going to be talking about um, UI. I want to kind of try and wrap up as much of it as we can so we can move on to other more interesting topics. Okay, so I'm going to spin up my, um, my Eclipse here. So I would ask you to do the same. So I'm, I'm pulling up Eclipse Mars. And I'm on page what looks like 26 of the of the PowerPoint. I'm, I'm going to keep firing through it like very very slowly until we get to the end. Um, let's look at uh, a couple things I've got. Remember last day I also talked about the midterm, um, both different methods for array, uh, the array method and the array list method that I, I kind of showed you. Um, so we're going to continue to do that kind of uh, show and tell here. Let's take a look at a new project. So I'm going to open up a new project here, a new uh, Java project. And I'm opening up new projects, not because we can't work with the old one, but only because it's great practice for you guys to do it over and over again so that you're comfortable uh, doing it. So we're going to just call this, uh, this, this one Comp228, and we're going to call this uh, Lesson 8. So another, another GUI lesson, right? Okay, and we're going to finish. Um, we're going to do the same kind of stuff that we normally do, which is I'm going to add this one into um, some kind of Git repository, right? Couple ways to do this. Um, again, I could add it through the, uh, the command line. I'm just going to try and do it all through Eclipse this time around, just to show you a different way of doing it. So again, there's not much in here right now, but I'm going to go into my source, and I'm going to create a new uh, class that we're going to call the uh, program class or the driver class uh, for this uh, particular thing. So we're going to call it program, and I'm going to ask for a public static void main and click finish. All right, all right, so there's our program class. And I'm just going to do some annotation here. 
which is, I'm just going to call it the, the driver class. So this is the driver class, right? And I'm also, again, I'm just putting some comments here for you guys. And underneath this, I'm also going to put on the public static void main, it's, this is the main method, main static method, right? That we, can, we have with all of our driver classes, pretty much. They run without a uh, kind of being instantiated, right? Okay, cool. So we got this. And now I want to save this on GitHub because, you know, that's the kind of guy that I am. I want to always work with GitHub when we are um, developing. We always want to have our partner uh, in crime, which is our, our uh, revision, you know, a system. Something to use, whether it's GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, uh, you can use SVN. There's also Perforce. There's tons and tons of different kinds of um, revision control systems out there. I recommend you partner with someone, right? And it's up to you what you want to do. When I mean partner with someone, I mean choose a revision control system. Visual Studio Online is another one. Even put it on Darm Dropbox or uh, OneDrive. Do something to back up your stuff so that way you don't lose your things. I don't want to hear, you know, like I told you before, my computer broke, I lost my hard drive, and I don't have my, uh, you know, uh, and crying to me that you don't have your programs and you lost your assignments. Please don't do that. Okay, so let's go to GitHub. And then, uh, because by the way, in, in the real world and at work, you'll just get fired, <laughs> right? I mean, if you have a, um, you know, if you lose your work, that's, that's just not good. So uh, let's go here. And I want to create a new repository uh, for Centennial College that we're going to call comp228, uh, and it's going to be called lesson eight. Now, again, I'm just making these repositories. This is going to be a public repository. I'm not going to add a readme right now. I'm going to create my repository here, and it's going to give me the credentials that I need Right, which is the URI, right, the Universal Resource um, Identifier, which is this right here, uh, to allow me to connect it with um, with my Eclipse, right. So I don't need to do any of this right now. If I wanted to do command line, I could follow these steps, right, and that would be the command line steps that I need right here in your in your command prompt or in your terminal if you're using a Mac or Linux machine. You could do these these commands, and this would be perfectly fine. All right, so let's let's take a look. Um, and how to do that. So I'm going to go back to um, Clips, and again, just to show you, I'm going to go to my uh, project here, right click, sorry, right click, and go to Team, and go to Share Project, and it's going to say, hey, do you want to create a repository in the parent folder? And I'm going to say, absolutely not, because that would ruin everything if I did the parent folder. I want it just in this folder. So I want to create, I can also choose an existing uh, repository, which I do not want to do. I want to have my own repository for each folder. So I'm going to click this create button as a shortcut. And when I do that, I'm going to choose where, which it's got to be in the right location, right? So I've got to choose, uh, you know, uh, courses. I'm going to go across here to uh, comp228, go down to my workspace, and then choose my files today, which is lesson eight. It's got to be in here because I want all the files for lesson eight. I'm going to press open, right? This is going to give me my path. I'm going to click finish. It's going to say, meh, you can't do that because the, the path already exists. That's okay. I'm just going to press cancel here because it's done what I wanted it to do. It's created this um, Git repository with no head, which means I don't have a commit. I've never done a commit. Let's do a commit. Right click. I'm going to go down to team. I'm going to go to commit. And it's going to ask me to do a commit. I'm going to include all the files I want to add in, including the git ignore file for my Java, which git ignore files, by the way, uh, they ignore certain types of files, so it doesn't load everything up on GitHub that you don't need. And put some kind of commit message, which is usually first commit or initial commit. Those are the standards. Let's make it initial commit. And again, a commit message is just a label for the snapshot that I'm getting for my files. This is the state of my files right now. I'm getting a snapshot of these files. And then later on, um, you know, I can always revert if I have a problem. Let's commit and push. It's going to bring up another window because I haven't set up my remote. And it's going to ask me for this URI. Now, this is where I, I kind of, you know, punch it in. I can paste it in. And there it is. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Let's go back to, the, to online to grab it from here from my clipboard. Go back to Eclipse and then paste it in. And when I do, it knows exactly what to put in. It knows my, because I've already set up Eclipse for my username and password. Uh, it's stored in this secure store, so I'm good. I never have to put that stuff in, all right? And if I click Next, it's going to ask me to continue. I can keep clicking Next and accept all the defaults and click Finish, and then all of a sudden, clickety-clack, if things went right, um, you're going to have everything up on Eclipse, or sorry, on GitHub, and let me take a look. There it is. So you've got everything, all your files, 
up on GitHub. Um, it's really that simple. And for people who want to do a poll, I want to add a README file. I showed you this before too, because this is a very common practice as well. I can add something like a description of my repository, which is you know repo for um, you know Java programming, and you can put whatever thing. I did it in different ways. Java, so it's like comp uh, two two eight at uh, Centennial uh, less than eight, right? So that's what it is. I want to add this little funny readme, and sometimes we can we put instructions in the readme file here of how to use our little um, a repository or the little app API that we've written. Okay, as an example, in this particular case, we're just you know calling what it is. But I want to sync it up with local, and I've done this a bunch of times. But let's do it again. I'm going to go into my lesson eight. I'm going to go right click. I'm going to go to team, and I'm going to go to pull, pull. And what pull does is it fetches or grabs everything that's online. So I know I'm behind now. And it's going to pull it back down. It shows me that I'm pulling my master branch. And I have this new head where it's going to move to create readme.md. That's what it's going to do. And I'm going to press OK. And what it's going to do is it's going to grab the readme file, which is right here now. If I double click on the readme file, I have access to this markdown file, this .md file here in Eclipse. Yay. Stuff you've seen before a number of times. But you know what? There's no end of practice for this kind of stuff. I'm going to keep showing you it so that way you're very comfortable using GitHub You've seen GitHub, you're sick of GitHub, right? Um, so that way, you know, when you go to other classes and if you, if you say, hey, how come that professor's not using GitHub? He should be using GitHub. That's not good. That's, you know, revision control practices. I'd like you to point it out. If I don't, if I forget one time to use GitHub, you let me know, right? Because that means I've, I've slipped. I'm slipping, right? I can't do that, right? You know, we've got, it's part of our process. Think about us as a company, right? You guys are all working for me. And, um, you know, part of our process, there's, there's going to be, in, in reality, there's going to be some automation. I'm going to probably have some automation processes in the back end, especially testing, testing automation to, to you know, test your programs. But definitely one of the pieces that are in there from a process perspective is some kind of revision control. Most likely it's going to be something like GitHub. Probably it's going to be in a private repository somewhere, right, that I'm going uh, to get you to put some stuff up. In this case, you can create five private repositories like we talked about before if you download the... Um, the Git package from DreamSpark. We talked about this, I'll, I'll pull it up one more time for people who, who've asked me in the past with email, hey Tom, how do you do this thing? Um, you go to uh, dreamspark.com under the software catalog, which is under students, under the software catalog, there's gonna be this additional thing called this GitHub for Education, which you can totally download. Um, and I want you to sign up. When you get your pack, you get a free SSL certificate you get a free domain from uh, Namecheap. Um, you get five free repositories with GitHub, and it's all part of your free uh, student pack from GitHub Education. Totally worth getting, all right? And it's free. So why wouldn't you get it? And the other one, like I told you guys before in other classes, is Microsoft Azure, right? That's a great little package to get if you want to host your websites uh, or your applications, mobile or otherwise, online. Microsoft Azure is a free student resource that you can uh, certainly sign up for and um, kind of be part of. Okay, so I'll leave that with you. Okay, and again, I don't work for Microsoft, but um, you know some of the stuff that they got is pretty cool. Well, with the GitHub pack, you also get a free subscription for nine months to DigitalOcean, which is kind of a really cool, an additional cloud service provider, um, which is something you may, may want to look into if you're on the website. Okay. <clears throat> So being the life of a developer is always learning, right? It's always picking up something new. So, um, you know, there's always this thing of, like, what did you learn today? Um, so this is the stuff we're going to do today. We're going to learn some new stuff around UI. Let's take a look. Back to the PowerPoint presentation, we talked about um, some simple things last time. Uh, JLabel, again, is an outlet for us, right? I want to pop some stuff up in, in a JLabel, right, for my JFrame. Um, how do I do it? Now, again, there's a couple ways of doing this thing, and I showed you guys how to do it with the, um, with the UI, this, this um, you know, uh, window builder that's part of Eclipse, right? Now, there's some really good things they do here at Window Builder, and there's some really bad things they do. Um, so, but it's, it's something that a lot of people use for a quick and dirty window. I want a really quick window. I'm going to add in a JFrame as an example, right? That's the kind of way of doing it. So let's do that again. So we're going to add another JFrame in here. I might ask you to do that, for example, Here's assignment three. You want to build a, a UI for assignment three instead of doing it with console for whatever reason. As practice, let's do it this way. So I'm going to click JFrame. It's going to ask me for this new class because that's what I'm building. I'm building a new class 
And the JFrame also has associated additional files in the background that you don't see, right? Uh, this by, by using Window Builder. All right, so um, again, I'm going to call this thing, you know, maybe something like example frame, example window. Let's call it example window this time. So here's my window, right? And it's part of the super classes Java Swing JFrame, right? So it's not the um, Java object class, it's the Java Swing JFrame class, right? And press and click finish. Okay, when I do that, I get a bunch of stuff, a bunch of stuff, right? And I don't like any of it, right? Because I don't want to run uh, my JFrame inside of a static class, as an example, that's run out of my application. I don't want that. I want to get rid of this, this whole um, uh, main method because I already have a main method in my driver class. This is my driver class. So the simple way to do it, of course, is to grab pretty much all this stuff except for this runnable piece. And we'll talk about what this runnable is later, right? Anyway, by the way, just, just by the by, anyone knows what a runnable is? You can hover over it and it tells you what it is. Um, it's an interface, and again, what it, what it does is it creates almost like an additional thread, if you will, right? And um, um, it's an anonymous th thread that runs. And if you notice, it says this event queue evoke later, invoke later, which means when I call my example window, it's evoke later. That's why we have to do it this way. It's because it's inside of a static method. Right, that'll it's going to run first. And if this is my only application, and this was I, I've kind of I'm kind of using this application to drive the program on its own without a driver class, just like right from in here. Neat, but I don't need it. I'm going to take my try catch because I like to look at my try catch block, especially when I try and open up a, a window. I remember try catch is the way we do um, exception handling. So I'm just going to you know grab this thing and I'm going to cut it. I'm going to go back into my program.java and inside my main method, I'm just going to tab in there just to make it look nice and paste. And if it doesn't look nice, I can always reformat it, right? There it is. I'm going to save that. So example window, notice frame is equal to a new example window, right? An example window is my uh, custom class that extends JFrame, right? So I'm, I'm using inheritance, so it is a JFrame. But it's my own custom window or JFrame class that I'm using. I'm going to get rid of all this now because I don't need it. Because this main method, I don't need. So it's useless, right? So bang, that's gone. So now all I have is my example window constructor function. This is what this thing is, you know, constructor method, if you will. So uh, here's my constructor method. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to call it that. So I'll say constructor method. And this is only one. You can make multiple constructor methods, remember, and you can make them um, overload uh, just like you would overload any other method by giving it a different uh, method signature, right? Different constructors. This one's only going to have one. It's the empty constructor, right? And there's a couple things here. One is that it says it's set default close operation, which is cool to exit on close, right? Uh, we set our bounds or default bounds for the window as 100, 100, 450, and 300. Let's change that to 300. So kind of a square window, making a new J panel. I don't want a J panel. Um, we're going to go with something else. But for now, let's leave it as is. Let's leave everything as is, by the way, because we're going to talk about different structures today. Okay, so this is cool. Um, but you know what? I don't want all this stuff to be in my, constru in my constructor method. I want this to be in some kind of other method, like an initialized method, where we set up our window for the first time without putting any other kind of stuff in there not any other labels or anything else, right? So I'm gonna, I can call this initialize or uh, window setup or whatever I wanna call it. Let's call it initialize. And I'm gonna pull it out by right clicking. I'm highlighted everything, I'm right clicking. And I'm gonna go to source and under the bottom here where it says, um, there should be, a, I don't know if it's source or if it's refactor, maybe refactor, sorry. Refactor extract method, refactor extract method. And when I do that, it's going to ask me for my method name, which I'm going to call initialize. I'm also going to make it a private method because, hey, by the by, why does anyone have to re, you know, reinitialize my window? So I'm going to call this underscore initialize, right? Initialize. Um, it's going to return void because I'm not going to really return anything by it. And I'm going to pick, uh, play, uh, select OK. Good. There we go. So what it does is it goes this. We're going to put the this keyword in there because I like to use this. This initialize, right? Um, I'm going to call the initialize the private initialize method. And let's, by the way, since you're making private methods, might as well put some uh, some comments. So private methods. 
right? That's what they are. Here we're just, we're just separating our, our code around by, by using comments. Again, you can create your own methodology for that. And your company that you'll work with will definitely have some methodologies uh, for how to you know, create comments. Let's go in here and I'm going to also say that this is my example window class, uh, you know, which again inherits from um, JFrame. It's my own custom class. In uh, C Sharp as an analogy, right, or an analog if you will, uh, we have the same kind of stuff in C Sharp. The, the, you have a form class in C Sharp and um, um, you extend the form class by creating your own form and renaming it. So example, I might have a, um, you know, a calculator form or something and my, my form might be called calculator form in C Sharp, right? And then it extends or if you will, with the colon, that's different syntax there, it extends the form class. The form class is part of the Windows form. If you ever did Windows forms before, right? That's what it does. So, example, did I spell this properly? Example window, that's my example window class. Okay, um, so that's pretty cool. Now, if you notice here, I've got some imports that there's an underline that says, hey, you know, this isn't being used, right? Kind of stuff, so I can take it out. Um, if I hover over it, it says remove unused import, I, or I can, clue, I can just choose organize imports. If I choose, choose organize imports, it gets rid of it. Notice how, again, uh, as it opens up, you can see that there's um, the imports are all bundled together. It's good from an optimization perspective to do this. All right, so I've got this. If I click on the design view now on the bottom, if my design complies with Window Builder, notice how I said if, right? You'll be able to pull up uh, kind of a preview of what my window is going to look like here in Window Builder, right? That's what it looks like. And now I want to talk about uh, J labels, right? That's what I'm, what I'm going to kind of put there. So I want to kind of drag and drop my J label um, into there, right? So let's drag a, a J label. Don't worry about the J panel there for a second. So how do I do that? I select my J label first, left click onto it. Now that it's uh, you know kind of highlighted or selected. If I go here, you notice I get an option to drag and drop anywhere in these panes. This is the default uh, kind of uh, layout for my J pane, my J panel, right? Using border layout. And if I click on this north piece, this is where my, my first uh, label will appear. And let's just call this kind of, we're going to call this a hello label, all right? That's what this thing is going to be called, right? So how do I, I don't want to type it here necessarily. I want to kind of put it down in here. Right, so my variable is called label or new uh, LBL new label. I don't want that. I want it to be called, um, you know, kind of. It's a no, I know it's a J label, but I want to call it a um, uh, hello label. So we're going to call it hello label. There we go. Just renaming it here. Um, constraints is north. That's where it's being put. The background, the color of the background is where it is. Um, is it enabled or not? My uh, font size, I can choose my font size for it if I want to, let's not for now. And my text in the label is going to be new label. Let's leave it as new label for now because I want you to programmatically change what it says in the label to something else. All right, so let's talk about how to do that, right? So how do I change what's in the, written in the label? Hint, hint, this is a great way to put to things together for your assignment three, right? By uh, firing off all the, the output for, for part one, which is that tally here inside your UI. It takes two seconds. You set up some labels, and then an example would be, you know, uh, some labels to describe what you're doing, and then some other labels down here, and then you have a bunch of labels that are inside your UI. Okay, so I want to change this UI label. Let's save this thing and go back to source, right? How do I programmatically change my hello label, right? And now this is something to think about my J label right now is inside my initialize method and that's not what I want because even though my initialize method sets up my window I probably want to take my J label and put it in something else like GUI builder some kind of GUI builder method or create GUI or something else that makes sense right um, you know create my UI components or or add UI components or something like that I also want to make this add UI components a private method so let's do that so I'm gonna extract this J label and I'm gonna extract it with my refactor and then we're just going to say extract method. I'm going to call this thing. It's going to be a private method. Then I'm going to say something like it's going to be called like uh, UI builder or, U, or or add UI components or something like that. Let's just call it add 
uh, UI components. Because that's what I want to do for my J, J, uh, you know, JFrame, right? I want to make it a private function and press OK. If you notice, it's going to add my add UI components in my initialize method. I don't want it there. I want it inside my constructor function. So I'm going to take this whole thing right here, this method call, and cut it and put it up here underneath my constructor method. So I've initialized first. It's kind of more clear here, right? I initialize, and then I add my UI components. And my UI components is going to have all my UI components going to add into my, my uh, JFrame. OK, here's another thing. I want to be able to modify my hello label in this particular case. Can I modify my hello label outside of my class? Take a look. Why? Why can't I modify my, my hello label? Yeah. Well, it's, it's in a private method, number one, right? It's a local variable that I'm using to assign to my hello label, which is of type J label. I'll, although I'm instantiating, I'm initializing it with this new label, this hello label is just a, a local object that's inside this code block up here, right? So this code block right here is where the J label uh, component lives and dies, right? I need to expose that somehow, and the right way to do that is to create some kind of instance um, re reference to this thing, right? So how do I do that? Um, well, up here where it says private variables, by the way, and, and I still have some work to do because content pane should be underscore content pane in my uh, you know best practices or conventions that I use. Again, some other professors might say, you don't need to use the this keyword. You don't need to use the underscore. Why would you do that? I'm asking you to do that for best practices, okay? So... Let's reformat or re refactor this one because I want to make it so that um, I want to kind of go to refactor, rename, and I want to kind of change this to my content pane with an underscore. I'm also going to add in references to my content pane with the this keyword. So let's do that now just to fix this up before we add this reference to uh, my um, J label here. I've done this a couple times, guys, before. So you've seen this method. So if you see me knocking marks off your exams or your assignments because you're not using the this keyword, you know why. Right? I'm asking you to do it. Okay. So uh, clickety-clack, we've got a reference to content pane, which is a private uh, instance variable. Let's men mention that here. So private instance, uh, instance variables, objects, whatever you want to call them up here. That's what they are. I want to make um, some getters and setters though for this right so if I create this J label as a private instance um, object I want to create a getter or a setter for this thing right somehow of accessing this object outside of my code hmm let's see how I can do this with effect so let's go into private and we'll write this thing as a J label right uh, is of type um, you know the, well, the, the name is going to be called hello label right Here's my hello label. I'm not going to instantiate it here, right? I'm just, all I'm doing here is I'm declaring it. Now, because it's private, guess what? It has to have an underscore, and I might as well change the, the name of the variable with a lowercase uh, h, right? Hello label, just for my format. Well, this means that down here, instead of just doing one of these, I'm going to change this to this dot underscore hello label, which is going to be a reference to this private um, component up here. Still can't access it from outside of my class though, right? Same thing here. I might as well just make sure that this is correct. This that underscore hello label, right? Uh, that's going to be added into my border layout in my content pane. Okay, cool. So this is cool. Um, I'm okay with that. So notice how my content pane is a private uh, container. That's what this J panel is. So this is a container. J panel container, right? And this is just a label that I'm using. Okay, how do I access? Any ideas? How would I access this thing if I want to access the properties of my of my J label outside of my, my class? How would I do this? I need to set up a getter and setter. Let's do that. Now the getter and setter we're going to see is going to be messed up, right? But let's just put let's just bring it forth anyway. Let's see what happens. Right? So I'm going to kind of right click. I'm going to go to source. I'm going to go to uh, generate getters and setters. I can do this anytime I want, as many times as I want. Um, I don't care about get getters and setters for my content pane yet. Uh, let's leave that out. And I want to kind of open this up. I don't necessarily need both of my, uh, my getter and my setter, right? I mean, getting the value of my hello label, eh, 
setting the value of my hello label, that's something else. So I want to make a setter. Now, how often do we just do a write only getter and setter? Almost never. It's usually a read only or both, one of the two, right? I probably don't need the getter right now, but I'm going to set it up anyway. Best practices, guys. All right. Okay, here's the access modifier. Is, should it be protected? Definitely not. It should be public, right? Because otherwise I won't be able to access it, right? Here's another one. If I make this final, that's bad, right? Because final means it's static. It's, it's never going to change, right? I don't want that. I want to make it so that it's not final, right? And I'm going to press OK. Now it tells me where I want this. After my hello label, that's what it says. After when my hello label is, um, is declared, right? And it says um, sort by fields in getter and setter pairs. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, allow setters for final fields, remove final modifier and fields if necessary. It says that there is an option. There's some, some really quick and dirty ways of doing these things, right? Let's press OK. Cool. I've got my getters and setters for my um, uh, hello label. I've got some problems, right? By the way, does anyone know why, why, why you have these uh, comments like this up here? Anybody? Tyler, you know? Yes, documentation. But if you see these comments that come up, huh? they're annotations. And what happens is if you actually look at these methods outside of my class, whatever I write here, again, is at, like, at return, the, the hello label, it'll actually show you those comments right, as a, as a preview outside of this class. It'll actually give you a little bit of a hint, code hinting. Right? That's what this is doing. Right? Okay, so I'm saying, um, I don't, let's not do that for now, because I'm going to go into this another day. So let's just make this, these are my uh, public, um, you know, uh, properties. That's what they are. Remember, public properties, private instance variables, right? That's the uh, kind of default. We've learned that in C Sharp. We're doing that here as well in Java. There's no difference. We kind of do the same things. Let's get rid of this too. Um, so these are my getters. This is my, it's, a, it's of type J label. Um, that's what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting. It's returning my hello label. It, what is this really returning? It's an object, right? Is it a value type or a reference type? Reference type. So I'm actually returning the reference to the object, which means I could probably make this thing, if I really wanted to, this hello label, I could probably make it public. It would be the same thing. Because I'm actually creating a reference. Remember, a reference is like, there's two objects. If you look at a variable, right? And the difference between a reference and a value, right? I can make a reference to any variable I want, right? The reference is like the address of the, of the variable, right? It's in C++ or in C. It's the pointer to the variable in, its, in the memory address, right? Location, right? And by value, I don't care about where it is. I care about what, what's inside of the variable. What's inside? Each, each variable is a container, just like this object. This object is, a, is of a custom data type called JLabel. We've defined here, right? Uh, or they, they've defined here in Java, uh, Java X Swing, right? So this custom object, JLabel, because it's not a, a simple type, right? And it's a complex type, it's a reference type. Because the reference type, the only thing I can return back outside of my class is a reference to my hello label itself, which is just the pointer that points at the address, right? So if I modify anything outside of my class, I actually modify the object itself. Make sense? All right, so let's do that. So let's first of all let's indicate that this is this dot hello label because just for for our for our purposes. And I really don't like the naming convention, and I probably could change the template, but I don't want to. Um, instead of get hello label like this, I definitely like the get. So we indicate what it is. And I want to say get hello label. Same thing with set hello label. Set hello label is going to be set hello label like this. If you notice that uh, what I'm going to put in there, right, is so if I want to set it, what am I going to be sending back to it? A reference to a new J label that I'm going to basically be assigning. Take a look at this. So I'm, I'm going to change the reference. I'm actually what I'm actually doing here in Java is pointing my objects. So let's say for example I'm pointing it at uh, Tyler today, and now you know what I assign this new uh, object over here with Faim. So I'm, I'm going to point it to Faim. All I'm doing is changing the pointer location. I'm updating the pointer so it looks at you instead of him. I'm not really assigning one to the other. When I do this assignment st statement down here, I'm taking this new label that I'm creating, which is a new memory location with its own address in memory somewhere, and all I'm saying is, hey, you know what? The, the label, the variable hello label is now going to be pointing to this new address. 
not to the old object that I had before. Leave that object to memory. Discard it. Who cares about it? Okay, so I don't want this. I want to call this hello label, right? And just so we know what it's clear. So hello label is the object. It's got to be of type J label that I put in there. If I'm going to create a new label, so I want to set up a new label for whatever reason. Okay? Chances are I'm not going to use this setter, right? But I'm putting it in there because I'm going to show you how you do getters and setters. Sorry, what were you saying? The other one will be discarded when we do when it when it when it goes through and uh, the program does garbage collection, it'll be discarded, right? If you ever do that, right? It'll actually be destroyed. As soon as you do this, then uh, once we do a pointer reassignment in Java, it'll destroy the other object, right? Now again, this is destructive uh, pointing, right? So when I move from one to the other, I'm actually destructively killing the thing out of memory as opposed to cleaning it up in a nice way. I'm not being nice about it. I'm actually like slapping the variable around. Eh? I'm going, hey, wake up. Now I'm not going to point you over here. I'm pointing over here. And the, the program doesn't like it too much when we do that kind of stuff, right? They like it so that we, we deallocate and reallocate. That's why C++, a lower level language, does de, uh, you know, uh, deallocate and reallocate it. We, hey, I'm an alloc, I'm an alloc and deallocate, right? I'm allocating memory and deallocating memory. I'm not doing that here. I'm just doing it by my reassignment. My reassignment call is actually doing that at a low-level uh, um, basis. It's reassigning and reallocating memory. Okay, so this is I've done this, and now I want to assign. Now that I have this, is it's, it's exposed because it's public. I should be able to see it here in my driver class. Let's go back to my driver class, and I want to update my label. All right, how do I do this? So first, I set up my window. It's visible. I need to do that, right? And inside my, once I do this, and once I call my constructor method, my constructor function is going to um, create my, or call my initialize, my private initialize method, which is here, probably here. <laughs> and then it's going to call my add UI components method that I've defined, right? So if I go back, that's what this, this call is going to do here. And it's going to assign a frame, this variable name, it's going to make it of type example window. I'm creating a new type, a new data type called example window. So every time I want to access my, uh, my new uh, uh, data type or whatever, my new object, I just access it with the frame uh, keyword, right? Frame.setVisible. Okay, cool. How do I access, how do I access the label uh, that I want to modify? I want to modify my label so it says, you know, goodbye, right, or hello. Right now it says a label. Let's try. So I'm going to say, um, so I'm going to say, first of all, frame dot, and if you notice, if I go get, here are the different get options I have. Get frame, I can do that. That's kind of built in. Um, I've got my get, um, uh, you know, some other window, and there's my get window. Where's my, where's my getter? How come I don't have that, right? Frame dot get. Uh, don't know, right? It's my frame. I've set up my my uh, private, um, you know, my here's my get hello label. How come it's not exposed? Anybody? Well, this is it right here, right? Here's my public, public, public. Here's my example window right here, right? Here's my private public example window. Here's my public set la set hello label, and here's my public J label type. Right, that's what it's going to return. It's going to return this get hello label, right, into my own label. Right, that's what I can do. So how come I can access it when I go back here? And outside of the try, it doesn't matter. Try, try, try catch is, is irrelevant. Although, and here's something that I have done, right? When I write it outside my try catch block, because my, um, very good call, my example window is being created, my frame is being created here, it's not available here. Right? Because it's only, it's going to live and die in these two, in the, within these braces. Right? That's a good call. But really, the try, you know, I don't have to use try catch, right? I'm using it because it's good practice, right? But anything that's between these two braces, this is where the program lives and dies, right? So this is where uh, my call to example window, example window, uh, you know, lives and dies here, right? So if you don't do it in here in my try catch block because I'm I'm inside these two braces, right? I can't access my frame from out here. I can only access it from in here. So this is where I have to put it. 
So frame dot. Now let's see what I get. If I go get. Ah, lots of methods. I go get, you know, bounds. That's interesting from a rectangle. I can, and if I if I start typing get, you know, my hello label, which is what I want. There it is. There's my hello label. And if you notice, I get uh, no code hinting. It just tells me it's a J, type J label and it's the example window is what it says, right? Of type example window. Okay. So here's my hello label. And what I want to do is I don't want to return anything. I want to modify it, right? So I'm going to put the dot. I'm using the dot modification. I can um, I can chain all of my commands just like I normally do in any um, C influence language. I can use the dot accessor method to further chain my commands. So I'm going to say I want to set the text maybe. So let's set the text. I'm just guessing here. Set the text of my label, right? To whatever the text that I want, and maybe we're gonna we're gonna call this thing, you know, hello world, right? Hello world, because we really haven't done a hello world yet, uh, with programmatically anyway. And let's see if this works, right? So we set the visible uh, window visible to true, and then later on we're setting our text to hello world. Okay, let's run this thing. We haven't even tested this thing yet. I'm gonna just run it and see what happens. Woohoo! Hello world. Anyone not understand what I just did? Let's go back. Right, so remember, I'm using the uh, reference. This is the local reference, an anonymous reference. I want you to think of it this way: anonymous reference to my get hello uh, label, which is this hello label right here inside my class. I'm using my getter. This is my getter right here. This is my getter from my hello label to get a reference to this private variable right here. That's what I'm getting, a reference. It's going to be the address of the private variable. And then it's like I'm saying frame dot underscore hello label. It's like I'm saying that. Set this property, the text value. I'm using the setter of the J label because remember J label has its own setters, getters and setters, right? One of them is set text. I'm going to set the text of this J label, right, to hello world. I'm getting a <laughs> reference. I'm getting a reference to the label, and then I'm setting the text of the label to another value. Okay, this is where students get lost, okay? Right? Because they're like, we're getting it, and then we're setting it, and I don't understand, right? Getting a reference, I'll say it again, getting a reference to the, uh, of the new object we've created called frame, which is a, an object of type example window. The example window is the one we made, right? Frame is just an object. It's an instance of example window, right? Then what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hmm, set the window to visibility to true. I'm using the setter method of the visibility property to true, right? That's what I'm doing. And then I'm saying, use my custom getter method for the hello label and set its properties to hello world. Yeah. Uh, we are. We're actually we're actually doing it right here, new label, right? See where it says new label here? I'm just showing you how you override it. So it originally state, stated new label. If I go back into design view, if if it's compatible, if it's compatible, right? Here's my design view. Let's see if it's compatible or if it changes stuff. Because be warned that the the, the when I go into design view using Windows Builder, right? In here in Eclipse. And same thing with IntelliJ and, and other things. It messes, it monkeys with my code, eh? Be careful. It doesn't leave your code alone, alone when I move into this view, right? Okay, let's take a look. Hello label, my variable is still set, right? Um, I have some stuff. I have my text as new label, and this is my preview, new label. But when I run my code, right, it says hello world, right? Let's go back into my source code and see if it's monkeyed with anything. We're pretty good right now. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty confident that we're going to be okay, right? Any questions around this? Right. All I've done is assigned, um, object, you know, kind of value to my label. The value that I've assigned, again, we we can set it in the constructor. What if I just do this? If I take away my new label, and I just leave it blank like this, can I do that? Is that allowed? If I go back to my design view, right, you can see that there's no label in here. Um, the reason why I would probably want to put some kind of placeholder text in there, right? And again, I can put in placeholder text or hello label or whatever is because sometimes 
we want to be able to gauge what our design is going to look like. If I'm using a drag and drop environment, might as well put in some kind of uh, placeholder text to see where it's going to be. Okay? All right, cool. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and then we'll take a short break. So I got my J label. I can use the set text method. That's what I just demonstrated, right? I can use the get text method, right? By using my getter. I can set an icon and get an icon if I wanted to get those two things. Probably not going to do these things with, uh, with our uh, you know, J label. Um, here's one, set horizontal text position, right? And set vertical text position and specify the text position in the label, in the label, right? Not on the form, on, not, on, not in the layout. That's totally different. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let's go back. So if I go back to design view, notice that we have this label that takes up the whole size, the whole width of my window. If I was to change my um, horizontal or vertical alignment for this, it wouldn't move my label, it would move the text that's inside of my label. The label's a container, the text would move around inside here, right? That's all it would do. Okay, here's something. What about if I, can I resize this label container? Because right now it's like, it's way over here. Can I do, you know, resize the size of my label, right? And the answer is not in this format, not in this layout. In this layout, right, you have no control the way it's coded right now, of how to use to change the size of my label. Notice under, underneath here that I don't have that. Notice that my constraints is north because I'm using it inside of a control, a content pane, which is inside of a, of a uh, the content pane is actually, if you notice, um, it's actually a, a J panel. That's what the content pane is, right? My border is an empty border, right? And my foreground is a specific color, right? And so on. Okay, let's go back out. So I, I can use my set horizontal text position and set vertical text position to change the, the where my text is going to appear, all right, in my label. Um, we did set default close operation with my JFrame exit on close. There's other options too as well. Like, for example, you can, instead of exit on close, you can minimize on close and so on. Um, we don't want to go too much in there. Let's keep going down this line here. Um, one thing to note, this is something new we haven't talked about. UIs are event driven and there's an event model for, uh, for creating any kind of button clicks. There's two things you need to learn when you do event and, and you know, the basic stuff for UIs. Eh? One is labels and some kind of text entry, like a text box. Those two, those three things actually. And the third thing is a button. <laughs> you need to know those three. If you don't know how to do a button, a text control and some kind of label, you're in trouble, right? Like you need to know those basic things, right? So it talks about here you creating an event handler. The event handling system in Java is a little bit more complex than we've, we've seen in other code, right? You would think, it would be nice to think that you can make a nice little event handler a callback function and you're good to go, right? It's not so simple in Java, all right? All right, let's take a look at uh, text fields, JTEX fields, and JPassword fields. What's the difference? What do you think the difference is between a JTEX field and a JPassword field? Anybody? Password field does not show the characters. It kind of uh, uh, obfuscates the characters in um, you know these little dots, right? So that way, it uh, you can't see them. You can't see what it is, right? J text field extends the J text component package in the Swing text, right? It says which provides many features common to Swing's text-based components, and the J password field also extends the J text field, right? So J password field is actually a child class or a subclass of the J text field class. So if you know check, uh, J text field, you know J password, all right? Okay, let's go and create a J text field, and let's put a first name in there, okay? So we're going to put a first name. So we're going to go back to Eclipse, and we're going to create a text, uh, kind of like enter your first name, uh, maybe another label that says uh, first name, and then the text, the, the, the label, the J uh, text field next to it. Yeah. All right, let's use our drag and drop interface, because we love doing that kind of stuff, right? So we're going to say our, we need another J label, Right, so let's take a look at, um, let's click kill our layouts, kill our containers for a second, go to J label, and I want to put it, but notice how it doesn't allow me to put it here. How come? It doesn't allow me to put it up here in north, right? I can put it here, right, in my west, right? So there's my west, there's my label, I can put my new thing. This is an interesting layout, right? Um, I can't put it right near there, though. I can't add it to, to my north, right? Even if I wanted to, I couldn't put it in north, right? It looks like it's center. And if it says vertical alignment is center, 
Um, I want to choose my vertical alignment as top because that's where I want to put it. So at the top next to the other one, right? I'm just change my vertical alignment here. And this is all on the properties panel right here, right? Without me having to code anything yet. Okay, cool. I don't have a, anything to label. I'm going to, there's a label for property too. I haven't created that yet. My new label has to have its own name. So I'm going to call this the uh, name label. So again, I'm going to, I'm going to make it so it's a private a variable that's accessible in my class. I know that, so I'm going to kind of create the convention that I want. So underscore uh, name uh, label. It's my name label, right? That's one thing I'm going to change. Constraints is west. That's where it's going to be housed, right? And uh, my text in the label is going to actually be a fixed text that I'm going to put in, like um, you know, uh, enter uh, name. There we go. Enter name. So whatever the name is, enter name. Right, and then uh, if I click away, it's going to update this thing. So it says enter name. Right, yay. And what about if I put this instead of uh, west, I clicked it to north? Could it work? Well, what it does, it actually wipes away my other one. So I don't want that. That's why you can't have in this particular layout, you can't have more than one object like that's layered in there. You have to create another content pane. So let's leave it in west for now, just to understand layouts. We're going to go back to border layout later on. Okay, cool. Um, and if I don't want to have a border layout, if I go back to my content pane and I want to switch from border layout, you know, to uh, a different kind of layout, right? I could certainly do that. I can choose my my different class here, right? So instead of my border layout class, I could choose a flow layout or something else, right? By replacing it, I could change my uh, my layout type, no problem, if I wanted to. Notice right now that the class is Java AWT border layout. I could choose a different kind of layout, flow layout, box layout. We should try and do that, to try and figure out how it looks. Let's do uh, let's do this flow layout and see what happens, right? Oh, here's new label and then there's enter name. Why? Because remember what flow layout does, it stacks everything in order. So I start doing one object, the next object, the next object. When I run out of room, it goes to the next line. That's what flow layout does. Okay, let's change from flow layout, let's change it to uh, a box layout, let's see what that does. Whoa, it's way down here, right? And what this does, well, box layout is very similar to flow layout in that it arranges things in order. If I go back to uh, my entry, and if I add another uh, option, like for example, I want to add in a, uh, a J uh, text box, right? There's a text field here, and I want to kind of, I can see that I can put it before or after, it just labels it here in this box, right? And if I was actually going to unclick this thing, so let's just press escape to unclick, notice that my box takes up the whole size of my screen, right? Um, could I, re, re, you know, kind of change the size of my box? No, right? Okay, let's do another layout. Let's do a grid layout, which is a very popular layout these days, right? So here's my grid layout. Yay, okay, I've got my grid. And now let's add, try and add another text field in here. So notice how I have a bit of a grid, right? But my grid right now, it shows, this is neat, two columns, right? Zero rows. Hmm, this is a better layout. I want to add a grid that has two columns and two rows, right? There we go. And here's one col here's one row, here's the other row. There's two rows. And then there's two columns, right? I can do column one and column two, no problem, right? So two columns, two rows with a different H gap a gap between the rows. Right now, the gap is uh, is zero. I can add in a column a columnar gap if I want. I can also make more rows. So instead of two rows, let's make it ten rows. See how that works. Ten rows. There we go. So now they're a little bit closer together, and you see a lot more rows here. There's not that, nothing that's being taken up, but you know I could do that. I also want to put in another column, right? So I want to take my JTEX field and put it over here. So this is where I'm going to put it, and I want it, but I want it to be up there. I want it, I don't want it to be down here, right? This is where my J text field is. I want this to be, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing my J text field. I want this to be in its own uh, column as opposed to uh, the column it's in right now, right? So how do I, can I drag it into its own column here by putting it somewhere else? Well, it drags it up and down the rows, right? Notice how I can just drag it up and down here in my view, right? But I can't drag it into its own column. So let's add. Let's go back to my content pane and, and choose, instead of two columns, let's choose three columns, see what happens. 
Oh, killed the rows. Let's go three columns and you know what? Uh, three rows. See what happens there. Okay, where's my where's my columns again, man? I don't understand this box, this grid layout here. Go back over here. It says columns ten, columns three. Oh, this is how how many columns this thing takes, right? So I only want a three column view for this one. Right, that's how this this goes here, and then if I pull it over here, it doesn't work. Same thing with this one. If I click on my uh, my text box for my new label, and I see my text box, there's massive, right? Look how big they are. So I'm just showing you different layouts as a different option, right? Because you don't have to use the standard option layouts that comes with my content pane, right? So three by three, with a, a V gap of a horizontal gap of one. I can put in that too. There's my horizontal gap. And I can put a V gap of one. Notice how it spreads things out a little bit, right? But there is no extra column. Even though I have three columns, three columns in my constructor and three rows, right? Um, I can't I can't control where this one goes. It says how how many columns does it take into effect? What's my background? What's my font? My foreground? Can't pull it in there. Even if I try, all it's gonna do is gonna pull it down. If I, I can pull it over here, it goes up. I can pull it down here, it goes down. So I, I can either choose a columnar or row layout. Right? That's what it that's what it looks like to me. So let's go back into my content pane. And then if you notice that's that's the grid layout. Let's talk about um, there's a card layout, there's a grid bag layout, right? Grid bag layout. There's a J uh, goodies form layout, and there's other ones. Okay, so for now, uh, because I'm, I'm just showing you what it does as an example, let's go back to this um, old school border layout that it, that it kind of comes out. Oh, there's also absolute layout. I forgot to tell you that one. What's, what's good about absolute layout? What's really good about it? I can put it exactly where I want. I can specify x and y coordinates. What's the downside of absolute layout? I got to do it for every little object on the screen, right? Um, a lot of times, relative layout is where let's try let's try absolute layout and see what it does. So absolute layout. There we go. I've got my J label here, and now look what I can do with my J label. I can control in absolute layout. This is much easier for students, by the way. I can control um, how big. My, how wide my label is. This is interesting. I have actually coordinates and I actually can see, let me make this a little bit smaller, this is much more control. You might say, you might think it's much more control here, but you'll be fooled into thinking that this is the right way to do it, even though it looks nice for now. Let's do it like this for now. Okay, so I'm going to kind of use absolute layout. Nice, nice and easy. Here's my enter name and let's put this over here, but you'll see that this will be a disadvantage later on because you need to create a whole constraint system to go along with this for it to work right. Okay, good. So there we go. New label, right? And then this is enter name. So I've done a bunch of different layouts as an example, but I like, let's use the absolute layout for now just to make it so that it's easy for you guys to learn. Okay, here's my enter name. And here's my, I'm going to kind of make this a little smaller. Um, here's my, um, uh, you know, my text box as well, right? Here's my J text box. My text field should be my name uh, text field. So I'll call this uh, underscore name text field. That's my that's what it's going to be called. My name label is the name label. That's what it is, right? Notice how I also have bounds now. 5, 41, 96, 3, 23. That actually comes down with the absolute layout, right? It tells me my X and Y coordinates, my bounds, and my width and my height, 96 by 23. If I want to match them up with this label, for example, I want this one to be 96 by 23, I can just change the value, 96, 96 by 23, right? And this is at 5 and 6, and this one is at 5 and 41, right? Lower down. And by the way, how do I know where the position is on my screen? The top left corner of my window up here is the 0, 0 point, okay? So 0, 0 starts here, it goes, it goes increases in x across this axis, and increases in y across this axis until you get to, this, to the size of your window on the bottom right hand corner. Okay, just like any other layout. So absolute layout is cool because you can set things up easily. Not cool when it comes to being, um, to set, if you want to change the size of your, uh, your window, it'll stay the exact same size, right? Which is bad, right? And we may want to limit the window size changing as well. Let's go back to our source code and see how it's monkeyed with our code. Because it's going to monkey with our code a lot now, right? Ooh, man. Oh, it's killing me, right? Let's take a look, right? We got some private um, 
uh, variables here, name text field came in as private. That's cool, right? What about my um, my name label? Right, where's my name label? I got my content pane. Let's just change this, this UI component. This dot content pane um, is uh, set layout null. That's interesting. Um, because that's the absolute layout. And then this hello label is equal to new J label. I'm doing that good, right? And then I also set my my bounds. Here's my set bounds. So this dot uh, underscore hello label set bounds to 5, 6, 96, 23. This is the x and y coordinates and the width and the height. That's what it does, right? Which is very, very easily understood, uh, understandable. And here's my name text field. I'm going to name text field. So this dot name text field is a new text field. Same thing. Set bounds, and if it's smart enough to know that I want to definitely put something in there, I want to add it to the content pane, and it says I also want to in my name text uh, text field should have three columns. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of that. So we don't need that. That's only for a columnar layout, which we don't have. So I'm killing that, and then here's my set vertical alignment to top swing constants top for my name label. I don't want that either. Who cares about that? That's that does no makes no sense to me. But I definitely notice that this is a J label of type underscore name label. I want this name label to be up there. So I'm going to take this whole reference here. Uh, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go up to the top. And I'm going to do make it a private field that's going to be another label underneath my hello label. So I'm going to kind of go private and paste, right, which is called name label. There it is. And then underneath here, down at the bottom, I'm going to say this this dot net name label set bounds and uh, this dot content pane add and then instead of defining it right here with another J label I'm going to say this dot name label is equal to new J, uh, uh, J label here which is enter name and then you know what I don't want it to appear here I want it to appear in order so I'm going to grab this whole reference and put it on top of my text field because I want my my labels and my stuff to appear in order there we go so here's my labels right and I can actually annotate them a little bit Right, so say something like this: um, "Hello label." Right, this is my name label. Right, this is my name text field. Right, this is where all these things are. Right, so you see what the what these components. And this is and this is basically saying uh, use absolute layout. Absolute layout. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna change this layout up later on. You're gonna see how this is all. This is gonna monkey with our code again, right? But um, as you see, we're pretty organized here, right? Okay, cool. So I've got my my uh, my text field and everything else. And you know what? I think it's uh, let's check the scene what this does, and then we'll take a short break. I'll upload this stuff to GitHub so you can catch up, and we'll get to the next piece. All right. So let's uh, let's check this out and see how it works. So so far, we've only set the value of my hello world. Right, as an example, and let's press play to see what this looks like now. Yay! So I've got my hello world, and here's my text box. And if I enter my name, I can name, I can do whatever I want there, but it's not going to do anything right now because I have no input method. There is no, I don't have a any kind of event listener set up to handle any kind of text input. I have no event listener to handle any kind of uh, button press or anything like that right now. All it does is it accepts a value. But that's all. What I'd like it to do, there's two ways we can do this. As I type my name, I want this, instead of hello world, to say hello and whatever my name is. Now, I can't do that as I type without some kind of event listener where I'm listening for keystrokes, right? So every time I click a keystroke, it changes what I'm writing up here, right? That's a more complex thing. I could also press submit, some kind of submit button or update, an update button that updates my hello world, right? I could do that as well, but that's the subject of the next topic, which I'm going to move on to. Uh, so for now, let's take a short break, and in the break, I'll update GitHub. <laughs>